My name is Lisa Townsend and I am your Police and Crime Commissioner and one of my jobs is to monitor the performance um, of Surrey Police as well as setting the direction for the force. Now whether you've joined us live or are watching later this meeting is a great way to get a first-hand account of how Surrey is performing and how we'll be working together in order to make everything better for residents right across the county. I'll be holding these meetings every three months and want you to have a say on the information that we provide. You can get in touch by leaving us a comment on the topics you'd like to see in future meetings um, and to improve the uh, performance that you receive and all of the contact details will be underneath this video. In this meeting we're going to discuss performance of Surrey Police, we're going to look at CCTV, violence against women and girls and some of the budgetary pressures that are facing your force but we're going to get started by introducing the team. First of all from the chief, we have the Chief Constable Gavin Stevens, we have Nev Kemp who is the Deputy Chief Constable and we also have Pete Gillett who is the Finance Director of the Force. From the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner we have Alison Bolton who is the Chief Executive, we have Kelvin Menon who is the Finance Director for the OPCC and we had Head of Performance and Governance Joanna Byrne. So welcome to everybody and thank you. So we're going to get um, started by talking about rural crime. So I'm going to ask uh, Gavin, the Chief Constable, if he could talk to us a bit about rural crime, because it is something that comes up an awful lot when I speak to residents. And I wonder, Gavin, if you could just give us an update on what the force has been doing. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, on rural crime, I'm going to hand over to uh, Deputy Chief Constable to update on this item, who uh, attended our most recent uh, joint agency partnership uh, group with members of the rural crime community and he can give you an update from the team as well. Thank you. Um, good morning. Yes, so uh, rural crime is an area that um, that we've uh, invested in in terms of resources over the last uh, couple of years and it, I was pleased that that was recognised when I met with a number of association representatives and landowners um, recently. The, the main issues that were highlighted then and are supported by the data that we have that they raised, um, there'd been a spate of thefts of um, GPS systems from uh, tractors and of course they, um, they're very expensive and they render the tractor effectively out of action so have, have a massive impact on, um, on the farmers who lost those. Um, uh, and we have an operation called Operation Walrus that is uh, targeting those and the, ha um, the thieves that are doing that, they are organised um, and it's difficult to protect the areas because of course they're quite isolated but um, we have seen a reduction in those since a, a um, key arrest has been made and we've been working with a number of other forces on that. Um, one of the other uh, uh, things uh, that has been a real concern is livestock worrying. And the third area of concern has been uh, in relation to poaching. Um, and poaching is something we've done a bit of work with our control room staff, um, uh, particularly following actually that that uh, particular meeting, because it's when you look at the sentencing powers around poaching, they're not always particularly significant. Um, in fact, we had a recent case in East Surrey where um, uh, we uh, uh, successfully convicted um, a man of poaching uh, and it, it was quite interesting that the, the defence put up was that um, by the defence lister this is something that wealthy people do this is just somebody who isn't wealthy who's doing it um, and I'm um, pleased to say despite that defence they were convicted but they've they received a hundred pound fine and um, and uh, 80 pounds costs um, and some confiscation of some of the equipment they were using. So we were disappointed with the sentencing there um, that, that we don't see that as a significant deterrent. Um, that, uh, and it's particularly concerning poaching because when landowner, uh, landowners do come across the poachers, they can sometimes be quite aggressive. And, um, and of course, they often have um, dogs with them and, and sometimes weapons that they're using to undertake the poaching. So we recognise our response has got to be really good and quick. Um, and that hasn't always been the case. Sometimes it's been a uh, um, uh, call taker has identified it as a poaching issue and not looked at the isolation, the vulnerability, some of the wider issues, the perhaps potential organised criminality. So that's something that we're working hard to um, improve our response on. Um, but in terms of uh, who we have working on rural crime, um, we have a number of specific uh, staff. We have uh, 
police community support officer on each borough um, and you you can see them uh, out and about rural communities because they have green epaulets on unlike the uh, normal blue ones that um, police community support officers have they have in enhanced training and really good links into local organizations and uh, networks uh, and then we have two and soon to be three full-time uh, police officers who work entirely on rural crime is there anything Thanks. specifically commissioner you wanted me to to focus on I think that's incredibly helpful actually. I think the public will be reassured. Um, you say that we've got two, soon to be three. When do we expect the third to be in place? So, so um, uh, that's being, uh, th there's a meeting in March to look at uh, resourcing and planning where we're hoping to be able to um, put an advert out and, um, and then recruit somebody um, into that role. The reason it hasn't happened yet um, is because although we've identified a need for the post, um, we've been recruiting like mad, as you know, Commissioner. We've had um, uh, an uplift of police officers, which has been really welcome, um, and a number of new routes into policing. Um, but those routes in do take quite a lot of time to get officers fully trained up. And so um, what we need to do is make sure that we're still able to respond effectively and quickly to emergency calls before um, advertising jobs and moving officers probably off one of those teams to become a full-time rural officer. So that's led to a bit of a delay, um, but um, we expect, I expect them to be in post certainly by the summer. OK, that's that's really comforting. Um, one of the things, of course, that people will know across the county is that Surrey is a really varied county. We've got parts which are uh, particularly those closest to London, which feel much more urban. And we've got parts of the county which are very rural. Um, the public are always interested and are always, I know, really, really keen to help and support in any way that they can. What would you say to the public in terms of how they can support their rural communities um, and make sure that we're all keeping everybody safe? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. So what, what I'd say is please do tell us, I mean, even if it's um, minor within rural areas, but equally if there are suspicious behaviour, please tell us. Um, I think all too often there's a feeling amongst members of the public that actually we wouldn't be that interested or unless somebody is seen actually committing a crime, they shouldn't call us. Um, but uh, in intelligence is our lifeblood really and, um, and uh, it the intelligence and information helps us firstly understand where potential hotspots are, but it also helps us join the dots with series of crimes. And um, and of course, that person making the phone call won't know what else we might know about that vehicle, that person, that area. So it's enormously helpful. And I'd, I'd encourage them to let us know it really isn't a bother. Even if we don't need to send an officer or community support officer at the time, we will log it and it forms part of our understanding of what's going on in that particular area. And um, some of our, our most successful um, collars of some of the organised and habitual criminals have been from small pieces of information that have come from members of the public. So uh, it would just be um, to encourage them to let us know. And not always on the telephone. We now have more contact um, from members of the public via our digital services. And you can do that at your leisure. You don't have to uh, stay hanging on at all. Um, um, although we're, we're pretty proud of our record of answering the phone fairly quickly in Surrey, it means that you don't need to worry about that. You can do it at your leisure and uh, we've got something in writing for, for uh, from you. And you don't have to give your name either. Um, there is Crime Stoppers, et cetera, as well. If you want to give us some anonymous information, we'd, we'd welcome that. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that update. Really appreciate it. Um, and to everybody who is watching, don't forget that you can always view the latest performance report from this meeting or find out any other information about the work that we do from the website, which is surrey-pcc.gov.uk. Thank you very much for that update. Much appreciated. We're going to move on now to looking at um, the performance report from the force. Um, and we're going to start with something which I know is very topical. And I've already had some uh, some comments in from the public this morning around there was a story in uh, The Times today looking at some of the official stats that were released last Thursday. So 
Chief Constable, if I could ask you specifically about some of these solved outcome numbers and rates and specifically in relation to burglary, which I know that people are really worried about. And unfortunately, according to the Times, Surrey is not doing very well. I wonder if you could tell us uh, what plans are in place to improve it and how we can give the public a bit more confidence that Surrey police really are working very hard to fix this problem. Yeah, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you. And um, yes, there's been quite a bit in the media recently about uh, crime figures and crime solve rates. So perhaps just set that in a little bit of context, first of all. Uh, so there are three things that um, uh, you may see reported in the media. And indeed, if you look at the uh, public performance report from today that we'll give an outline of. So uh, there's police recorded crime statistics, um, which then feed into the Office uh, for National Statistics or sometimes the ONS statistics that people talk about. Uh, and then there's also the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which is, a, uh, as it sounds, a survey measure of people's experiences of crime. Uh, and sometimes that gives them uh, uh, you know, diff different stats, but hence different recording method. Uh, the first thing to say is that um, uh, Surrey Police remain the fourth safest county in England and Wales and the safest county in the southeast. Uh, and in terms of uh, residential burglary, uh, that decreased uh, nationally by 19 uh, percent uh, over the last 12 months. But in Surrey, we saw a 35 percent decrease in burglary. Um, so uh, it's some of the lowest levels of burglary that I've ever seen in my almost 30 years of service. So um, uh, pleased to say that it that it is a safe place. However, as as your question outlined, uh, we've got an awful lot of work to do uh, in terms of solving more crime uh, for our communities. Uh, so in the last year, we solved 74 fewer uh, burglary offences uh, than than previously. Um, so, um, which you, you know results in a, ve a very low uh, solve rate for Surrey of about three and a half percent, which of course is nowhere near um, what we would want to do for our communities. Uh, there are a few um, uh, reasons behind this uh, drop off, and of course we will see when we go into later parts of the performance report that this drop off on solving crime is something that is a challenge to police services nationally and certainly to here in Surrey. But specifically on burglary, some of the some of the reasons why. Uh, well, um, uh, the way that we uh, collect uh, forensic and digital evidence now is changing. Uh, burglary offenders are very smart at not leaving a trace behind. One of the ways that they too sometimes leave a trace is a digital footprint rather than a physical forensic footprint. Um, on the physical forensic side, uh, that's uh, very well regulated and um, uh, soon to be accredited now, and we've received favourable reports from the from the regulator on our uh, progress on that. Uh, and we have recently, on the digital side, set up a, a digital investigation support unit. So this is a team of highly skilled people who are able to help investigators recover any digital evidence uh, that might be associated with that crime offence. So, for example, if a vehicle is stolen as part of that burglary, uh, then uh, download from the electronic of the vehicle as to uh, what investigative opportunities that that might clear up. So a lot more that we've got to do on uh, digital forensics. Um, we also know that during the pandemic that one of our uh, successful routes for burglary detections is to talk to those that we have uh, arrested and imprisoned for burglaries and do what what we call prison interviews, prison clear up. Sometimes you might see it reported as, of course, none of that has been able to happen during the pandemic because we've not been able to uh, get into get into the prisons du uh, du during that time. Uh, I guess the other thing to recognise is that in, in these statistics, uh, uh, residential burglary does include sheds. Uh, so these are not always break-ins to people's homes that we're talking about. It's to sheds and outbuildings as well. Uh, that's a common feature of the offending across Surrey. Uh, and one of the things that we um, sometimes rely upon for these investigations is to be able to look at series and patterns and trends. Uh, because the numbers have been very uh, low in comparison to what we've seen before, sometimes those trends and series are not easy to spot in the intelligence analysis uh, they appear as sort of um, you, you know you could argue sort of random uh, occurrences I mean we do sometimes pick out series and trends often it's those series and trends that then lead us to the identification of offenders through use of automatic number plate recognition patterns of vehicle movements uh, as the deputy was saying on the rural crime report reports of suspicious suspicious activity that come into us uh, and that will um, uh, give us a, give us that initial lead so identifying those series has been a little bit harder uh, during the pandemic. Um, just a few things on what we're doing to try and tackle these issues. So we've launched a force-wide initiative called Operation Falcon. 
that's a big uh, part of our investigation improvement program. Uh, involves very close scrutiny of the investigative standards on offences, uh, some principles that we're asking the investigators to follow. Um, we've recently introduced in November of last year uh, a prison investigation team in custody to provide, um, uh, uh, you know, more more rigorous uh, custody investigation procedures with specialist teams that will be rotated through there uh, to get their skills up. Um, we're running some focus group activity with investigators to find out from their perspective what their uh, what their obstacles to um, uh, to, to solving more crime are. Uh, and we've also volunteered to be part of two uh, national studies uh, conducted by the Home Office, who of course are interested in uh, what's happening nationally on this issue. Uh, so there's some uh, specific uh, group work looking at the uh, blockages in the criminal justice system, which we've, we're involved in, uh, and why matters are not progressing through uh, Crown Prosecution Service and into the court system. Uh, and we're also doing some activity-based analysis with another eight forces nationally um, to look at, down at the, the sort of fine detail of what uh, the police activities are and whether they prove uh, successful or not in um, clearing up work. So we recognise there's a lot to do. Uh, we recognise that it's um, uh, it's not uh, given our communities the service they absolutely deserve in terms of solving more crime, uh, but just set in the context that um, uh, it is still uh, one of the safest counties in England and Wales, and we have seen a much bigger decrease in burglary uh, than the national statistics as well. I think on, yes, thanks Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you, that's very helpful and the context is of course incredibly useful, but of course what the public will say is what about them, what about if they yeah. are um, if they are burgled and, and somebody comes into their home or their shed or their garage and yeah. you know, whilst the statistics are, are helpful and I think we can all understand that they do help to put things in context, it doesn't help an individual resident. So what would you say to an individual resident who has been burgled um, and they dial 999 or they dial 101? What is going to happen for them? So we will attend. So we, we will attend residential burglaries, of course. Uh, and uh, burglary is one of those offences that is almost universally reported to us. So we don't see a drop off in burglary reporting. The only times that burglaries sometimes are not reported to police uh, is when it's a burglary between rival criminal gangs. Uh, so, for example, if um, uh, they're stealing commodities or, or cash from each other, then sometimes they're not reported to us. But generally, residential burglaries are fully reported to us. So please do uh, keep doing that. You can expect a good response. Uh, we will uh, survey you for your views on how we've uh, you know, quickly we've responded, what what the quality of service is that you get when you get there, whether we keep you updated, uh, whether you think the action we've taken has been uh, effective or not. Uh, we do that via a text message survey and uh, the views that you give us uh, are fed back to the individual investigators. So they will get your feedback on whether they've given you, whether you feel that they've given you a good service uh, or not. Uh, typically in those satisfaction uh, uh, measures, we see uh, uh, low to mid 60% satisfaction, uh, uh, clearly room for improvement in that. Uh, the areas where um, our communities tell us that they would like us to do better is in keeping them informed on the progress of investigations uh, and in the practical action that's taken. And for that, it's exactly what we've been talking about. You know, people want to see uh, the offenders uh, being, being brought to justice for the offences that they commit and where that doesn't happen. Uh, clearly, that's going to hit the satisfaction score. Uh, so you can expect a really good standard of service for us at the scene to follow those investigative leads. and. Um, uh, you know, uh, my my colleagues want nothing more to be able to clear up these crimes uh, and keep the county safe. In fact, um, I was just discussing with a deputy this morning that we're at an unusual period uh, in um, in policing in that all through my service, uh, the the volume of burglary, so the amount of burglary going on in an area is normally correlated with whether or not you've been successful in uh, securing offenders and locking them up. So if you if you identify the right offenders and get them in prison, generally your burglary rate goes down. Uh, we've broken that trend in the pandemic. So uh, burglary rate is down significantly, but so is um, uh, so is the volume of clear up. I've never seen that before in my career. Uh, so this is a you know it's a it's a real challenge for us, uh, but one that we're determined to do much better at.
That's good, yeah. And we know that, um, of course, we have seen problems with the criminal justice system and court backlogs, which is affecting everybody. Um, we all recognise that during the pandemic, obviously, burglary went down massively across the country. Um, and it's not a huge surprise that it went down even more in Surrey, given how many residents of Surrey commute into London normally and therefore have been um, able to work from home. With the country largely now going back to offices and going back to work, there will obviously be more empty properties in Surrey. And so is it reasonable, first of all, to expect the burglary? rate to rise and secondly are Surrey police resourced and equipped in order to deal with that rise? So we, we would expect uh, some increase we've we've already had uh, some recent arrests um, of foreign national offenders which um, those that have tuned into these performance meetings in years gone by uh, will know uh, three or four years ago we had a significant series throughout the southeast uh, from foreign national offenders um, where the uh, proceeds of the burglary were making their way back overseas. Uh, that led to a, um, a big joint operation with police forces throughout the South East and our colleagues in London as well. Uh, we've had some arrests recently, again, of a similar sort of series where uh, organised criminals um, uh, target particular postcode areas. So we would expect um, offences like that um, to increase. And that's where we, we uh, work heavily on the intelligence and that and digital investigation that I mentioned, automatic number plate uh, uh, recognition and so on. Uh, um, in local boroughs and districts, I, I know how our borough and district commanders have been do lots of preventative work as well. Uh, so um, I commend what's been happening over on Surrey Heath, for example. Uh, Alec James, the inspector over there, uh, did a big problem solving initiative on burglary with some real practical helps and tips. So, uh, for example, having a bin buddy. Uh, so we know that burglaries uh, uh, can be correlated with people not taking their bins back in. Very simple thing. Uh, get yourself a bin buddy. Make sure you've got a neighbour if you're not going to be back that's going to take, take your bin back in for you. Uh, um, uh, lighting and movement in the house, all really important. In in in, in my home, I have an automated light, lighting system. Uh, not uh, very expensive now to be able to install those things. Uh, can uh, switch lighting off on a sort of random pattern. Make the house look occupied if I if I'm if I'm not there. Uh, if you can afford it, uh, get yourself a decent alarm that's serviced annually. It, that will reduce your insurance premium as well if you do that. Uh, all of those things uh, really really do help. That's great, Chief Constable, thank you. I'm going to move on now to another issue um, that is also within the performance report and something that's brought up with me when I speak to residents, whether it's at parish council meetings or out on doorsteps. Um, and that, and I think it may well be slightly a perception issue. And I wonder if you could talk about it, which is knife crime in Surrey. Yes, of course. So um, maybe if I just set knife crime in the context of uh, overall um, violence. So uh, in violent um uh, reporting. Um, there is uh, much of our violence is um, might uh, people might find it surprising that it doesn't involve any injury. Um, so uh, violent crime as a as a category that's recorded, much of that does not not involve injury. But of course, you would expect us to look very closely uh, at those violent offences that do involve injury. Uh, so going back to those Office for National Statistics uh, measures that we were talking about earlier. Um, the uh, violent crime to September of last year decreased nationally by uh, uh, 3%. In Surrey, we recorded a 6% uh, decrease. Uh, and in Surrey, we have the lowest levels of uh, serious violence, violence with injury nationally. Uh, and uh, sorry, the second lowest nationally and the lowest uh, within the southeast. So um, in terms of overall levels of serious violence, Surrey is a, is a very safe county uh, to live in. Uh, on uh, knife knife crime, um, we were down on knife crime last year. Uh, we don't see a lot of knife crime offences in Surrey, so we were down by 44 offences. So we're you know we're talking just a, a a few a few tens of numbers that we're down on, uh, and our outcome rate, so the amount of knife crime that we clear up, is currently standing at about 19.5%. So one you know one in five knife crimes we're uh, we're clearing we're clearing up. Um, we've done an awful lot of work. Um, uh, on on knife crime with uh, colleagues in county council and elsewhere uh, to try and reduce violence. I, I think you can see from those figures that we're starting to have some success on that. Uh, and uh, just before the pandemic, there was a fantastic bit of work done by uh, one of our intelligence uh, analysts who looked at the uh, different um, uh, categories of knife crime and the different reasons that people were carrying and uh, carrying knives. Uh, that's led to a lot of preventative work uh, in schools, a lot of educational work. Uh, one of our detective superintendents did a master's degree study uh, on how to um, 
uh, influence the peer group of knife crime offenders uh, to deter them from knife crime as well. Um, so lots of great activity going on across the county. Uh, there is sometimes we hear from young people that the reason that they carry knives is because uh, that um, uh, they, they, they feel unsafe and they need it for, for protection. If you carry a knife, you're increasing the risk to yourself. Uh, and it's one of the reasons in Surrey that I took the decision that we do not advertise knife crime seizures on social media. Uh, we do not sort of um, add to the fear that young people might see because the overall context for Surrey is it's a very safe place to be. Now, we're not complacent because we do see uh, uh, knife crime attacks, particularly associated with drug related criminality uh, and county lines activity uh, and on that front we um, uh, work very closely uh, with a central metropolitan police operation uh, and a specialist team that we have in Surrey to take out those county lines uh, dealers uh, and when we take out those lines which we've done very very successfully we've taken tens of county lines out of circulation during the pandemic um, uh, seen a good national recognition for the work that we've done here and when you take out those county lines you automatically reduce the serious violence that's associated with them so uh, we do work work very hard at that because that's one high risk area where we do see knife crime attacks that's really encouraging chief constable thank you and i'm sure that um, residents across surrey will be really encouraged by the the work that's going on um and also uh, in particular how safe surrey is um, especially regarding knife crime um, I want to move on to, to road casualties. Now, obviously, during the pandemic, we were all stuck at home, uh, or a lot of us were, um, and our cars weren't being used very much. We know the roads were much quieter, and so we saw collisions coming down. Um, as I said earlier, of course, that's going to now start increasing. Um, what action um, is being taken, first of all? Um, and when will we have a dedicated resource to tackle what we know are the five biggest causes of collisions? Um, and what message would you like to give to the public regarding road safety? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner. So, um, of course, in Surrey, we do have uh, a section of Europe, Europe's busiest motorway network with the M23, the M25, uh, the M3 and some significant air roads as well. Um, uh, those roads we work very closely uh, with highways um, on to keep as uh, safe uh, as as possible. Um, we do see uh, serious collisions on that network, but the area where sadly we see uh, loss of life is often on our um, rural road network, uh, which uh, can be much more uh, dangerous in combination, as you say, with those uh, with those fatal five factors. Uh, so a, a few things that we do in prevention terms, I'm really, really proud of the work that's led by Surrey Fire and Rescue Service uh, on a campaign called Safe Drive, Stay Alive, which has been running uh, for, uh, I think, a decade now. Um, and um, that uh, um, gets an educational programme to all new drivers across the county. Uh, and we have seen a direct correlation between that, uh, that programme of work uh, and the number of uh, our young people that are ki killed on the roads. Sadly, we still see it, um, but it's a, a fantastic programme that I would encourage. If there's any uh, parents of young drivers watching this now and you don't know that your sixth former has had that programme, please do speak to the school and please do get them to watch that content. Uh, there's some fantastic online content available on YouTube as well if you look for uh, Surrey Safe Drive, Stay Alive. From an operational point of view, of course, we have an extensive safety camera partnership network. Uh, I visited them just early into the new year uh, to award a, a long service award um, to one of the colleagues that leads that unit there. Uh, and that, that team do around about 100,000 prosecutions uh, for speed and camera offences across the year. So uh, we sometimes uh, get letters into my office. I'm sure you do, Commissioner, to say, what are the police doing about speeding? Well, around about 100,000 prosecutions a year is what we're, uh, what, what we're doing on speeding. And the team are now very sophisticated, able to look at, um, uh, for example, people that run under the red X's on motorways and enforce that, because that's very dangerous to uh, colleagues who might be at the scene of an accident, uh, attending to that, uh, or at an obstruction on the motorway. So please do uh, 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 pay attention to those red X's. We do prosecute those now, because it's really dangerous. Um, the Fatal Five uh, team uh, were already um, uh, up and running with. 
Um, uh, in fact, I, I met the sergeant on the uh, on the on the visit that I did. Um, so uh, they're going to uh, specifically uh, tackle tackle those high risk issues uh, and do that enforcement activity. Um, I'm sure those that have tuned into these sort of meetings in the past or to some of our social media feeds will see some of the innovative work that we uh, also do prosecuting um, people using mobile phones, for example, whilst driving. Uh, or those uh, points of inattention that um, uh, uh, you know can lead to um, uh, lead to collisions. On that fatal five team, as I say, there's a sergeant in there, uh, and it's um, uh, uh, got uh, six uh, police constables, uh, and it'll be fully staffed uh, uh, later later this year. Um, just a few statistics on it to sort of put it into context. Um, so looking to November, the role in 12 months to November of last year, we look at two things, uh, what we call killed or seriously injured collisions and killed or seriously injured casualties. Uh, so on the collisions, um, uh, we saw 589, uh, which was pretty much what it was the previous year, an increase of just of just three. So very, very similar numbers. Uh, and on, on casualties, 640. Uh, the previous year had been 626. Now, um, it's really important when talking about numbers like that, just to think of the human tragedy that lies behind them. You know, a serious injury is what it sounds like. Um, you know, these can be uh, a devastating injuries that can change the course of people uh, people's lives and of course within the, within those figures are fatalities as well um, so we will be working hard with that new team and of course all of our existing uh, roads policing uh, provision and our armed response vehicles are often out on the major road networks as well uh, to, to tackle those um, those causes that lead lead to these collisions. Thank you very much, Chief Constable. That's good to hear. And as you say, we uh, we must remember and sorry that we have one of the most dangerous and busiest stretches of motorway in Europe. Um, moving on to the last issue in the performance report, I want to talk to you about 101 answering, which, as we know, has been a real struggle. Um, the average wait time now is nearly five minutes, although, of course, an awful lot of people will have to wait an awful lot longer than that. There have been difficulties, obviously, around the contact centre, around staffing and in particular with COVID. But what can the force do? What are the force doing to ensure that this figure improves? Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. This is one of the things that we pay very, very close attention to. So, again, just a little bit of context on if you call us on 999, then you can expect a, a very prompt response. And our figures on 999 are, are very consistent to, to get to um, get to uh, those really serious issues and issues in progress very quickly. Our 101 is our non-emergency number. So, uh, uh, this is if you're uh, contacting us um, with a sort of routine matter. So often, there, often there is a wait, but of course we don't want there to be a wait that discourages you reporting, and we we like to try and uh, to sort of keep that within a minute or two because we know uh, that people will drop off. So we've seen we've seen an increase uh, in the, in the in the time. Um, the, a few factors leading up to that. Um, so as you mentioned during the pandemic, we've had to um, uh, separate our uh, contact handlers into different locations uh, to avoid um, the risk of uh, any inspection uh, infection spreading throughout what is a what is a just a big office a big open plan office and uh, so we've moved between different locations to try and reduce the risk and keep that resilience up uh, of course we have like every other uh, organization seen COVID infections and seen our 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 resilience uh, knocked at uh, points during the pandemic uh, I'm pleased to report that that's now coming back down to the levels that we would normally see for any winter pressures um, so whereas this time last year we were approaching a 15 percent abstraction rate that's a lot of people uh, we're, we're now between five and seven percent on any on every on any, any given day so uh, with that staffing resilience um, I'm confident that we will start to see some improvement in those wait times uh, and the other thing that we're uh, looking to get back to normal on is just as soon as we can and of course the uh, guidelines are reviewed regularly with the um, national guidance from government, but also uh, the work that we do with the health and safety executive is being able to get back uh, together in the same location because that just gives us a natural resilience of having the team together. Uh, one of the other things uh, that's uh, changed some of the uh, performance, and this was a conscious decision on the part of the force, was that in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we introduced a digital 101 service, so an ability to report to us online 
uh, through a chat function on the website or through any of our social media channels. It doesn't doesn't matter which one. Uh, it just comes in as a text, uh, you know, text conversation with the operator on the other end. So these are the same colleagues that uh, uh, usually answer the phone, some additional training to deal with that digital contact. And we've seen that being really, really popular. Uh, and actually, it's um, opened up the amount of reporting that's that's uh, come into us for the public. So um, it's actually um, uh, revealed that there was some sort of untapped demand that people are now willing to come to us with. So we're really grateful for that because, as I and the deputy have said a couple of times this morning, we really need people to report to us that lifeblood of intelligence. Uh, but it does mean there's a higher volume of reporting coming into us and as a that uh, there's a little bit more of a weight on the telephones now we we want to get that back down hopefully the measures i've described uh, will will help in doing so and of course if you're interested in being at the very front line of policing and working in this area then we are recruiting uh, contact handlers it's a really challenging job but a very very rewarding one uh, if you want to come and see what it's like working with us here at our headquarters at mount brown that's great, Chief Constable. Thank you. And I have uh, recently welcomed a couple of the new intakes of, of contact handlers. And I have to say, what's so encouraging about them is that we're seeing all ages, all backgrounds. They're coming from a really wide range of um, of different occupations and, and backgrounds. And that's really, really good to see. So, yes, they really, really are on the front line. Um, I want to move on now to something that has come into us via the public, one of the issues they want to talk about, which is CCTV, which, of course, it's a really interesting one. It's something I'm asked about an awful lot, whether I'm with councillors or residents, um, but also businesses, shopkeepers. Um, it's something that that comes up time and time again. And, you know, I think CCTV is something that's, that's really changed from being this big brother thing that was sort of out there to something that actually a lot of us now have um, on our on the front of our own homes, whether it's with ring doorbells and others. And I know that the police can often make really great use, actually, um, of that as well. So. I know there was a the force had developed a five year strategy um, that ran to 2022. And of course, now that we're in 2022, this strategy is coming to an end. So I wonder if you could explain uh, what the force's strategy is going forward around CCTV and what the position is um, and how we best support the districts and boroughs in, in their community safety efforts as well. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. And I, and I think uh, this is an area where um, uh, your office and the force can work very closely together on um, for the for the future safety of the county. So, um, I guess if I give a bit of historical context, lots of the investment in um, uh, town centre closed circuit television uh, came in the late nineties and two thousands, um, particularly following the Crime and Disorder Act, uh, and there were some uh, significant funds made available nationally that um, local boroughs and districts could bid against to get those systems in place. Uh, uh, some uh, established really um, uh, quite sophisticated, uh, well-invested, extensive systems. And we, we see those, for example, in uh, in Runnymede and in Guildford and in Walking and other boroughs and districts um, uh, in, invested less. And of course, uh, in doing so, they would consider, for example, what their crime levels were in their area, how much disorder and so on. And we, of course, we've got to set this in the context of Surrey being the fourth safest county in England and Wales. And, um, you know, uh, it, it often um, uh, local organisations, local political leaders will want to invest their, their money elsewhere. So there's not a universally um, uh, um, distribution of CCV across the county. There's not a common sort of network of how it operates uh, because of that sort of differential investment going back 20 years or so. Um, over time, uh, those that were established well have uh, seen refresh and reinvestment. And also, as that's happened, uh, the regulation surrounding CCTV in terms of um, uh, human rights and scrutiny and uh, professional monitoring and so on have all tightened up uh, uh, during those uh, couple of decades. Uh, at the same time, as you outlined in your introduction, Commissioner, we've also seen um, new technologies emerging. So in policing terms, uh, a lot of our uh, forensic work that we do on um, uh, video now comes from a whole range of different sources. So uh, we have, a, we have a, an online um, platform um, uh, that's provided across Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire and Thames Valley uh, that's effectively a digital evidence store for all of that material. So uh, that can be um, footage from uh, officers' body worn videos from uh, mobile phone uh, footage that people uh, use from household security cameras and doorbell cameras. 
uh, from bus videos and helmet cams on cyclists. So the, the range of material that we're getting uh, is absolutely exploding in volume, which gives us another uh, challenge in terms of the storage and cost of storage. But the investigative opportunity that comes from that uh, is now much greater than we see from CCTV. So that poses the question about the strategy, then what is CCTV for? Town centre CCTV um, can be really valuable in managing events and nighttime economy and patrol and deployments. Uh, and I think that's uh, probably why over those couple of decades you've seen it become well established in places like Walking and Guildford because it helps with that town centre management, uh, the, the nighttime economy uh, with events and so on in, in, the, in those areas and, and, and hence the investment has kept up. But it's not been the case in other areas. In that five year strategy, we had a plan for policing to uh, support any local schemes through a, a funding decided on formula, uh, but for us not to um, uh, to own, the, own and run the staff associated with that. Uh, that transition hasn't been uh, uh, fully, fully achieved. And in fact, just in recent weeks, I was in discussion with chief execs about uh, we think now is the appropriate moment as we're coming into the final year of this strategy to have another uh, thorough refresh. Um, and uh, decide what it what it is that we want for a county, how how we best um, uh, keep keep our residents safe. Um, I should say that in those areas where um, uh, local boroughs and districts have taken a decision to um, uh, re remove some of the capability, that's been done in very close consultation with us. Uh, and in the sort of hotspot areas, they have so. Uh, so if I get would well, give an example of Rygate and Banstead, they're retaining key cameras in hotspot areas around uh, public parks uh, where they see a need for it, and in car parks. That actually links with what the uh, the evidence base says. So there was a an international study done by our College of Policing about the effectiveness of CCTV uh, that did show that in places like car parks, it can have a preventative effect. Uh, for those that are planning to go out and do event offences, uh, it's less successful on spontaneous offences, uh, acts of violence, for example. And of course, we see that routinely in police in the nighttime economy. Uh, the CCTV operators, you know, are, on a busy night out, will see fights routinely break out. People are not worried that they're on CCTV because they're uh, they've lost their inhibitions and they're drunk and so on. Uh, but it does help, of course, with that um, directing resources to that initial response. So. Um, uh, quite a lot involved in that, but uh, I think the summation of that is that we'd really uh, welcome collaborating with you and your office and the um, uh, the Burren districts um, across the county to um, get us a strategy that's now fit through to uh, beyond 2022 through to 2025, 2028 and beyond. Thank you very much. And yeah, as you say, the technology has moved on enormously. Um, so it's absolutely a good, a good time to be looking at refreshing and working closely with all of the districts and boroughs. Specifically looking at East Surrey, now that we know that Rygate Police Station is obviously going to stay um, with the announcement on the Building the Future plan and, and the plans to remain at Mount Brown. Um, it, what is going to happen to CCT provision for the East? Will it still be catered for out of the police station or is that going to be looked at being done separately? Uh, we're o open to discussion on that. Um, and I know that um, uh, there was a very detailed report went before Rygate and Banstead Borough Council with the council's own analysis and some analysis from us that um, uh, resulted in the numbers of cameras that they wanted wanted to keep. Um, but in terms of any new strategy, um, then uh, I think we absolutely keep an, keep an open mind on that. So, for example, um, one of the things that I was talking to uh, chief executive colleagues was about was the sort of next generation camera capability, uh, not without controversy, because next generation cameras are often not high up on a pole. They're uh, sighted at different levels in order to be able to do things like facial recognition. Uh, we know facial recognition, um, there are still some uh, legal arguments around it broadly falls into two camps, uh, retrospective facial recognition and proactive. No issue really on retrospective facial recognition because that's what we do now in screening video footage. So I think any member of the public watching this, if they knew that the police had a thousand hours of CCTV to go through to try and identify offender, you would probably want us to use that technology to reduce that thousand hours to 10 hours, for example, uh, to you know uh, pick out potential suspects and do matching with databases and so on, if it's after the offence. Uh, the more controversial area is proactive use of facial um, uh, recognition, where effectively you would have a um, uh, a list uh, of subjects uh, that you were trying to seek out, 
Now, again, there's degrees of acceptability in here. I think if we if we said to people we're proactively looking for somebody who we think is about to per perpetrate a serious act of violence or a terrorist attack, most people would say, yes, <laughs> please do go ahead and do that. Um, but if it was to, I don't know, um, uh, proactively look for domestic violence offenders that were uh, breached their bail or were out, you know, outstanding on arrest, how would people feel about that? Um, so an interesting area for future years to come, but that sort of technology requires much higher quality cameras and for them to be sighted differently than the current CCTV infrastructure. But clearly a debate that we've got to be, we've got to be central to and uh, understand from our communities what their appetite is for that sort of technology too. Great, thank you very much. And yeah, clearly there's a, there's a much wider debate um, to be had both within and outside of policing around what, what the public are comfortable with. Um, moving over to the to the west of the county um, for a moment, um, I was wondering when I speak a lot to, we speak, well, we all speak a lot to Guildford residents and particularly Guildford businesses and those in the town centre and also the, our nighttime economy across Guildford. And I was wondering, um, stakeholders have been a bit concerned about the lack of support they've had during peak times. And it's something I've heard about recently. I wonder or what the police force can do in order to support that. Well, uh, very willing to listen to those concerns, Commissioner. Look at the uh, the detail of what's happened. Uh, as I say, in places like Guildford and and Walking, where we've got those those um, sort of built-up areas, that different uh, field of the economy, then we would absolutely want that system to function well. And we're we're committed to funding our part of it on a for, on a formula on a formula basis. But clearly, if we're refreshing the strategy, that's one thing that we will want to look at again jointly. That's great, thank you. Um, and finally on CCTV, our Designing Out Crime Officers who do a fantastic job, I know right across the county and I've had the pleasure um, of meeting a few of them, they do really great work. What role can they play here in terms of working with the districts and boroughs um, to support residents and businesses? Well, um, the Designing Out Crime Officers is uh, one of the things that I would attribute to those uh, lower levels of crime across the county that we've been talking about this morning. We've got uh, a really active network of colleagues that are uh, well regarded in their field. Um, I, I was talking to um, one of them that would, told me about a, a housing development that they'd um, been involved in right from the start um, over in Mall Valley. Uh, that in all of the years it had been constructed, it had never seen a successful burglary. Um, because the environment had de been designed from the start. Some attempts, but no successful burglaries. Um, so really important to be involved in that uh, scheme development early on. So uh, if there are any um, uh, businesses watching this or uh, local authority um, colleagues and councillors watching this, then please do think about design our crime officers. They will be working very closely with your planning departments anyway, but uh, get us involved right from the off because um, uh, they can int introduce some uh, principles that really help the future security of developments and uh, I've been out and uh, presented a few of the uh, final certificates when the developments come to fruition and uh, uh, I know the developers are really proud of it um, uh, the local residents that live there really no notice the difference and of course the teams uh, get a big big reward from seeing their work come to fruition um, those design out crime officers though can uh, offer a service after the event as well so they're they're free uh, to residents and businesses to use so uh, you can just get in touch with your local borough or district team look them up on twitter or facebook page or search our website each of those borough and districts have got access to a design out crime officer who can come and do you a security survey they can give they can uh, give you uh, really great advice they um uh, of course, we don't recommend uh, companies and products and installers, but we can give you the guidance on which ones were approved to the to the right standards, so you know that you're going to get a going to get a good product if you're going to invest money uh, in security. So that's a free free service available to all all residents and businesses, and would re really encourage people to use it if they if they didn't know about that. Thank you very much, Chief Constable. Yeah, the Designing Out Crime Officers really are a fantastic resource within policing. Um, I'm going to move on to now something that I know is top of everybody's minds um, and is incredibly topical at the moment as well, which is um, financing and the Surrey Police budget. Now, the Police and Crime Panel will this week be meeting uh, along with me and my team to discuss the preset rise. Um, as many of you will know, a survey went out before Christmas asking residents right across Surrey how much they would be prepared to pay for policing across the county. Chief Constable, I wonder if you could explain to us some of the pressures that are currently on Surrey policing in terms of the budget and what's being done about it and what you would like to see and what you would like the panel to be considering this Friday when they meet. Yeah, of course, Commissioner, thank you. And uh, maybe 
bringing Pete in as the finance director to um, talk of um, some of some of the detail in a moment. But if I just give some uh, some headlines, so um, the, probably the first thing to say is that. Uh, the last uh, 10 years have seen significant financial pressure on policing and I, I recognise that's a tough message because throughout those 10 years local residents in Surrey are consistently being paying more and more uh, of their council tax on policing contributions but we've taken out £70 million of savings from Surrey Police over the course of the last 10 years. Why is that? Well our the amount of grant that we get from central government is effectively at the same level now, in fact a little bit less than it was 10 years ago. Um, so the amount of funding we get from central government is flat or decreasing and of course inflation over 10 years is quite significant and police inflation is different to general inflation. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, the amount that we need to put into digital investment um is you know significant compared to the sort of average householder you know the digital forensics works that we've been talking about that explosion of storage of cctv all of that costs an awful lot of money and there's no sign anytime soon of that getting any cheaper um so inflation is a, sig a significant uh, pressure on us we we do realize that all of that amounts to us coming to surrey communities and saying that if you want to maintain surrey as good quality policing, keeping us there as the sort of fourth or fifth safest uh, county to live and work and visit in England and Wales, then it does need that continued investment. Um, but I accept that in practical terms, that means that Surrey residents are almost playing for their policing twice <laughs> uh, in, comp in comparison to um, to other county areas. But we are really grateful uh, that people uh, make that choice. And in the recent survey, Commissioner, that you did uh, come out in favour of wanting to have a, a, a well a well funded police service. What that money uh, will go towards is um, uh, helping us uh, finish off the commitments for all of those new teams that we talked about. So uh, this morning we've talked about rural crime and Fatal Five team on the roads, but uh, there are teams going into um, and violence against women and girls that I know we're going to come on to talk to about uh, later on the agenda. Uh, and to fill in all of those detective vacancies that we so desperately need in order to solve more crime for people as well. Um, and we, as, at the same time as want to invest in those areas, we want to maintain our really high quality local policing that we do in Surrey, those neighbourhood officers, those police community support officers uh, across the county that we know our communities really value and are central to, um, to keeping crime levels low. Uh, the other thing that um, I, I probably just mentioned, and um, of course I know when uh, you know households and businesses are finding it really tight, this is a sensitive topic. Um, but um, co pay for colleagues in policing has been a real pressure as well, and that's particularly important to us in Surrey because. We're recruiting heavily, yes, and we're not seeing any shortage of recruits, but we do need to retain them when we've recruited them. And we know that Surrey is a very difficult area to live in. Um, uh, colleagues in police officers are effectively at the same level of pay now that they were 10 years ago. Uh, and it would take many, many years for their pay to recover to um, uh, an equivalent point to match, match, match inflation. Uh, so we don't, as a chief constable, I don't decide locally on pay. It's done through a national pay review body. Uh, but we are making a case this year uh, that our colleagues deserve a, 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 a pay rise just to help them keep pace with that uh, cost of living in what is, a, is in what is a very expensive county. So we are going to need to spend uh, some more money uh, on, on, on pay and reward to keep people appreciate that's a difficult message because I know everybody's struggling. Um, but if we don't take uh, those measures and of course they're very expensive te steps to take, uh, then we do just run the risk of having a revolving door of recruitment and that's really expensive too. And it doesn't help us build up the skills we need in order to be much better investigating those crimes that we were talking about earlier. So. Uh, that's a bit of context, Commissioner. I don't know whether you want to come back with any questions or move to Pete on some of the detail of the budget plans. Yeah, I, I think no, that, and that that is helpful. Um, so, in in that sense, obviously, I will go into the police and crime panel on Friday. What what are you saying that you need me to be recommending to the police and crime panel? We, we need uh, when the the spending review. Um, uh, took place over the summer months uh, of last year and in, in policing we made a really strong case for a three-year settlement for policing which we've got uh, and it's a reasonable settlement it doesn't by all means cover all of the pressures I mean uh, we've all seen inflation running at a much higher level than we uh, expected it to be 
uh, although it was a good a good settlement in the government announcements uh, the the figures that they uh, said were coming into policing were reliant on the full use of local precept flexibility so a 10 a 10 pounds increase uh, even with a £10 increase, we've still got something in the region of £6 million of efficiencies to take out. So, you know, we're adding to that £70 million of efficiencies that I've already talked about. So even with a maximum increase, we will still be um, making the money work really hard. If we weren't to get that maximum increase, uh, then some of those investments that we've um, talked about, uh, we would have to uh, reconsider or we would need to look to where we where we make um, cut, cuts elsewhere. And of course, we really don't want to cut back on local policing services for people. So uh, absolutely, the force is advocating uh, to you, Commissioner, and I know that um, your position to the to the panel uh, is in order to keep uh, this county as safe as it possibly can, and to be feeling safe as well, we we need that full flexibility. And and finally, on the issue of finances, can you just sort of spell out for us and for the public exactly what, for example, a five pound increase as opposed to the ten pound would look like for Surrey Police and therefore for our residents? Yeah, well, bear in mind that. Um, uh, more than 50% of our budget now comes from local taxation as opposed to central government grant. Uh, we're not well insulated from a change of that nature. So if, um, uh, you know, unlike uh, some other county areas where their government grant is more than 80% uh, of their overall budget, maybe that difference in precept, you know, wouldn't uh, be as significant for them. But for Surrey, it is really significant. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, you know, I clearly um, don't want to... Um, uh, un unsettled communities, but you would you would expect us in the force to look at scenarios where we don't get that full ten pounds and look at what that would mean to service provision, and it it would mean some really difficult cuts in the service that we're that we're we're able able to make, um, and you know we we've already talked about this morning. We really want to keep those one on one answering times within acceptable levels. We want to keep those um, uh, community policing services. We want to do the specialist services on the roads, and uh, I say about to come on to violence against women and girls and. Um, uh, we, we really don't, don't want to have to uh, cut into some of that activity. Uh, people listening might say, well, what about your um, your back office services? You know, can't you make savings in those? Uh, they've been really, in that 10 years of £70 million worth of savings, they have been cut and cut and cut. Now, there is some opportunity for um, for further transformation, but that needs investment in order to do it. We're, we're beyond the stage now where there are easy savings to take. And if you want to move to the next level of transformation, then that uh, requires investment um, uh, uh, to be able to do that. And we have got some exciting plans coming up over the next 10 years uh, where we want to sort of transform the service. You know, we talked about all the, you know, the digital revolution stuff, for example. Uh, and we already collaborate on our HR, finance, IT uh, with colleagues in Sussex Police. Uh, we already have some collaboration. Um, uh, across the region as well. Uh, all of our specialist crime services and all of our operational services are all collaborated with Sussex as well. All of those things have driven out significant amount of um, uh, resilience and savings over the last 10 years. So there's there's no easy places we can go um, if we only had five and not 10 pounds. That's great. Thank you. And very clear, Chief Constable. So moving on finally to violence against women and girls, which is another topic that comes up an awful lot, both within my office and I know Chief Constable for you as well. I know it's something that, that you get asked about an awful lot. And of course, there has been some really great and positive work done by Surrey Police on this and something that uh, our inspectorate body, HMIC, FRS, um, has noticed as well, which is incredibly positive. Um, I know that there is a a strategy that's going to be submitted to chief officers in February um, and I just uh, wonder what the plans are around that and to make sure that as an office the APCC and, and I am also cited on all of that work. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. I, I maybe just open up with a few sort of um, headline points uh, set in the context of some of the statistics that's happening and then uh, hand over to the Deputy Chief Constable to um, uh, talk about the, the plan that he's been lead, leading with colleagues. Uh, so on, on the safety point, I, I mean, those that have tuned into these uh, meetings before that will know it, uh, 
I, as part of my sort of commitments to the county, have uh, have got a twofold promise, really. We want a county that is safe, objectively safe in a way that you can measure it, and also one that uh, feels safe as well. So just a few just a few um, uh, stats on that. On the feelings of safety, uh, in our latest um, independent survey, looking particularly at female respondents here, 75% uh, of them said that they feel very or fairly safe walking alone after dark. Um, now, you, you might say that's quite a high level, but actually it's dropped a bit from the 80s for Surrey. So um, now the impact of uh, some of the horrific national headlines may, and, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, the extent of the debate that's been going on uh, might have, have affected that. Um, so we really want to get that uh, back up to, to a higher levels. Um, reporting concerns online through Street Safe Surrey. If you just search that online, then you can report locations to us across the county where you think might want uh, better lighting or uh, shrubbery cutting back or um, uh, uh, policing presence to be there at certain times of the day and so on. So please do use that Street Safe tool to report to us, uh, and we will work with local partners to uh, to try and get that that um, that figure back up again. So that, that's the sort of public sort of space point, and I know that the deputy will come on to that as part of the strategy. Another part of the strategy is dealing with serial perpetrators to really have a perpetrator focus against violence against women and girls and because uh, predominantly this is male perpetrated violence against women. Uh, in Surrey we measure the, the number of repeat perpetrators that was running at over a thousand uh, for Surrey. They're just the ones that we know about uh, with the work of our high harm perpetrator unit. Uh, so that's a unit that concentrates on the most uh, dangerous offenders. We've we've driven that down to 940. So still a long, long way to go, um, uh, but uh, shows our uh, our determination to um, uh, to to tackle um, uh, the uh, you know that these uh, repeat perpetrators. Um, uh, in terms of supporting victims, we do uh, uh, survey uh, victims and survivors of domestic abuse and they give us their views. Uh, the current um, uh, figures show um, uh, low 80s percent satisfactions. We have been in the 90s before, uh, which we're really proud of. We want to keep that at uh, really high levels. Uh, there were actually in that dip into the low 80s, for some reason, there were fewer respondents to the survey. Um, we're not entirely sure what that was in the latest figures, which are not, not published in the paper that's with, with this meeting today. I can say that it has risen back up again in the latest quarter to 89 percent satisfaction again, uh, which which we're pleased with. Uh, on serious sexual offending, um, uh, we we have seen uh, increases, particularly as lockdown restrictions uh, were lifted, uh, but we remain the sef second safest uh, county, county nationally for serious sexual uh, offences. Um, and I'll just finish with one notable success um, uh, from, from Friday before I, I hand over to the deputy. And uh, um, uh, uh, one of our um, outreach partners were in touch with me on, on Friday evening to uh, share the news of a significant prosecution that went through the courts uh, on on Friday. So this was an offender uh, with three three different victims charged with 21 uh, offences. We got 18 guilty verdicts off that. Uh, the cumulative total was 102 years uh, of imprisonment. Of course, they won't, in, in this system, they won't say of 102 years. Um, uh, but a 15 year concurrent uh, sentence, a deemed a dangerous offender, so an extended license uh, after um, the original one finishes. So that'll be for a 15 year license, uh, sexual offenders register for life, sexual harm prevention order uh, for life and restraining order times three for life. So that's the sort of result that we can get against some of these highly dangerous offenders uh, when we work uh, collectively with our partner agencies and that's exactly what the uh, the strategy and the plan is intended to do and um, uh, happy to take questions commissioner i'll hand over to the deputy to talk through some of the um, the details of the plan that's great and i know an enormous amount of work um will have gone into securing that conviction chief constable from from your colleagues um from of course our partner services right across the county and of course um very importantly from the victim um and the witnesses as well who of course um will will have put an enormous amount of 
time and effort and emotion into securing that conviction as well. So, so congratulations to everybody involved. And I hope that we can hear a lot more of those cases. Um, I think that's exactly what we need to see. Before we move um, over to the, the Deputy Chief Constable, I just want to ask you about something else that I know is on the rise, which is stalking. Um, and I wonder if you could just spend a few minutes um, talking about the rise in stalking, what Surrey police are doing about it, what happens if you are a woman or a man who reports stalking, how the police handle it, and just give a bit of reassurance to the public around how we're handling that. Absolutely, yes. And um, uh, stalking or coercive controlling behaviour as well, um, we've put an awful lot of um, uh, training and investment into in, in, in recent years. We are seeing the numbers increase, uh, not hugely so in the last period. So we're on coercive controlling behaviour, uh, we were up um, uh, by just 20, 28 offences. Uh, each each one of these additional reports, though, we, we um, uh, count as a success because it means that it's been identified. Um, uh, and we expect that this is a, a much under-reported under area. Uh, there's a new um, a screening tool, a stalking screening tool uh, that we're using now to make sure that we're identifying them amongst other reporting because sometimes the reporting person doesn't realise in the in the description that they might be given to us when they call that 101 number or contact us online uh, that they're actually being stalked and it's through conversation that, and the stalking screening tool that we will uh, that we will identify it. Um, I mean the things to look out for is if it's uh, unwanted uh, if it's fixated, if it's repeated, uh, then some uh, some clear clear signs of, of stalking behaviour. And particularly if it's escalating, then we would really, really want to know about it because that sends a, a sort of high risk uh, signal to us. Um, on that um, uh, uh, screening tool, we are working with a number of uh, forces on a university evaluation of that. I believe it's Middlesex University that... Um, working with uh, some forces on that uh, and we've introduced some advocacy workers as well uh, that can work uh, alongside um, um, those members of our community that are experiencing this awful crime uh, to make sure that their interests uh, are looked after as well. Thank you. No, I know that people will be um, reassured by that because it is something that an awful lot of women and men have faced um, and it's not always the easiest thing to report. Um, would be absolutely delighted to hear from the Deputy Chief Constable about the work that, that he and others are doing around the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, we, we were one of the first forces nationally to have a strategy of violence against women and girls, and it it, um, it predates the terrible events in relation to Sarah Everard and her murder, um, because we do recognise that it, it is an important area and it's one that's underreported, um, and um, and that there's also a trust and confidence uh, issue with um, some women reporting that to us. So we've worked hard in in all of those areas. Um, uh, just take the opportunity to try and um, provide some reassurance and do a bit of myth busting if I can as well. So what, one of the um, uh, things often at the centre of a crime um, of violence against a woman will be the woman's phone. Um, if it's domestic or uh, stalking, as you've just mentioned sometimes, um, and quite often with a sexual offence. And, um, it, we, you know, we recognise in Surrey that it's... Um, that, that that woman will have been through something really traumatic already and the last thing they want is to be without their phone where most of us nowadays our lives are on there for any extended period of time so what we try and do is agree a time when we um, can examine part or what we need to of that um, of that woman's phone um, with them and we we try and make sure that we hang on to it for no more than 24 hours um, and uh, so I know that that is something in the past that has, that has uh, put people off and I just want to reassure that reassure people that we do that as sensitively and as quickly as possible um, the uh, we've um, invested quite heavily in this area we um, uh, during the last year have set up teams specifically dealing with domestic abuse um, and that's to make sure that we've got officers who um, who become really very specialist at dealing with that are really well linked into some of our partners and the chief constable mentioned one of them um, one of our partner agencies um, East Surrey domestic abuse service over um, on, on uh, East Surrey who we do a lot of training and work with um, but it also means that they understand that victims of domestic abuse Abuse present in different ways. They don't always understand that they're a victim, even particularly where it's um, uh, co coercive and controlling behaviour. Um, and um, 
th- uh, those teams have gone down extremely well and we have um, uh, officers that are seeking to to not only join those teams but stay on on them because they really do enjoy that specialist work. Um, uh, overlaying that, we've had other developments such as we've got specialists now in um, that um, are not police officers but um, work and will report to us and support victims in uh, in uh, Surrey's hospitals now um, because sometimes victims will end up in hospital and they won't have reported it to us. They won't report to us without the victim's consent but they will give them that support and encouragement uh, to do so. Um, and then um, uh, in relation to our most serious sexual offences, um, we've seen, as as you've highlighted, an increase over the last year of about 20% um, of reporting. And as the Chief Constable said, we're still the second lowest in the country um, or second safest, but we have seen quite a significant increase. And uh, in order to match that demand, we've increased our number of specialist investigators by four working in that team. Um, and uh, I spent some time with that team recently. Absolutely fabulous committed officers and I uh, just want to say the the care and compassion that they have is 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 absolutely moving the determination to try and bring offenders to justice is superb and um, so if anybody is uh, listening and they're in two minds as to whether to report something all I can say is that as a victim we are there to support you and uh, we will do our absolute best to to um, bring the offender to justice, but that's with with you. Um, that's not making life difficult for you. We recognise you've been through something traumatic already. Um, and then just if I can just finish, really, we, we, what's important is um, uh, understanding two things. Where things are happening that go unreported, and we've done a survey, um, we've had uh, over 5,000 women uh, that have contributed to that around which parts of Surrey uh, they feel safe in, which they don't. We're overlaying that information with our own data so that we can work um, with partners to make sure that we can target the right areas. But we we also uh, need to get our internal culture right when it comes to uh, domestic abuse and uh, violence against women in particular. And um, we uh, have been one of the leading forces in terms of making sure that those um, uh, women that in particular, women who are victims of uh, domestic abuse where the offender may be part of a police in, policing organisation, so whether that's Surrey or one of our neighbouring forces, then that we absolutely deal with that appropriately and fairly and transparently and give them the confidence. And that means, for example, that where it, the suspect is somebody from um, Surrey Police uh, you, they will not be um, investigated by anybody who has any relationship, even on social media, with anyone involved. Um, we, um, and there are a number of measures like that that we've put in place to make sure that the investigations are are absolutely um, uh, clear and also they're restricted so that we don't um, cause any additional embarrassment to to um, to any victim involved if they're part of our organisation. So, um, what we recognise is the way that we uh, treat crimes with our own officers and staff is is a barometer, I believe, for the way that we deliver our service to the public. And so it's absolutely vital to me that we get that right because our officers and staff will look at each other and see how we're dealing with crimes uh, internally. And so I absolutely want us to set the highest standard there because I think then it's right to expect officers and staff to be able to give a really good service to the public. Uh, the Her Majesty Inspector of Constabulary um, College of Policing have commended us for the work that we've done on that. And indeed, they visited us to look at best practice that can be taken to other forces. Every single uh, one of those crimes gets reviewed on a monthly uh, basis independently. Um, and also on the group that we've, I've had working on that, we've had an independent um, uh, chief executive from a domestic abuse charity and sexual abuse charity to, to advise us and absolutely apply that independent scrutiny. So this is something we, we really do take seriously. And uh, I'm really proud of some of the work that we've done there. Thank you. And that's it's particularly great to hear, I think, about the work that's being done internally, because I think you're absolutely right, Deputy Chief Constable, that um, how we police our own um, is absolutely vital and is such an important part of giving um, the public confidence, particularly in, in light of um, recent reports in the media about some police forces, although um, thankfully not Surrey. Um, 
I'm always amazed um, and, and really disheartened um, when I hear people say to me that domestic abuse, domestic violence doesn't happen in Surrey. Um, and I wonder if you could just um, just for a couple of minutes explain the impact that statements like that have, first of all, on victims coming forward um, and why it's so important that we we sort of don't think that domestic violence or domestic abuse happens to any certain category or any particular category of people, but actually can happen to anybody and everybody. Yes, absolutely. Well, I can confirm that it does happen in Surrey and it happens no matter what class of society you are, how wealthy, poor you are or wherever in Surrey you might live, whatever your your um, vocation is, whether you work or you don't, you can be a victim um, of domestic abuse in Surrey and we see that every single day. So uh, and it's important that we don't make those um, it's, it's a crime that doesn't really discriminate um, and it's one that utterly ruins the lives of those victims. Um, it, it is all consuming. It affects them uh, sometimes not just physically, but it also uh, affects their confidence um, and just their quality of life hugely. And we I've seen that in Surrey happen um, where um, uh, the victim and offender have absolutely no money worries and very wealthy right down to those that um, have the stresses and strains of having very little income. It doesn't matter. It can it can affect anyone. And that statement to say it doesn't happen in Surrey is, is only damaging. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. And I think that's a really sobering point um, on which to conclude this meeting. I'd like to thank everybody who has watched. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who's taken part, particularly, of course, to the Chief Constable and the Deputy Chief Constable, but also to all of those who work incredibly hard behind the scenes to make these meetings happen. Now, the next performance and accountability meeting will be happening on the 16th of May, and we're going to be discussing rural crime and neighbourhood policing, as well, of course, as the topics that you would like to see raised so don't forget that you can get in touch and let us know your questions or comment in on any of the conversations and the discussions that have happened on today's meeting. Now you can see the papers for this meeting as well as learn more about my role and the role of the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner and Surrey Police on my website which is surrey-pcc.gov.uk. Thank you very much to everybody who's taken part today, whether you were watching or helping out behind the scenes, it's very much appreciated and we look forward to seeing you soon.